Uh, I will start with uh, thanks to the organizers and thanks to a lot of Russian journalists and scholars who provided the information that's going to be in here. And also with an apology, uh, originally I thought I had about 20 minutes for this, uh, then I was told it was 10 to 15. I'm going to gallop through these. Uh, I didn't have time to take out some of the slides, but uh, a lot of the information is in the paper, and since we're all going to memorize it, uh, we can start there. Uh, basically, this is Russia's fourth crisis since 1989. Uh, I won't go through all of them. Uh, that's in the paper, at least briefly. Uh, basic bottom line, if you have to leave early, is that after 1991 and after 1999, Russia did use the economic crisis as a basis for significant reform in 2008, and now that's not happening, and that is a disaster. Uh, so the response was major reforms after 1992. Uh, a little awkward talking about this when Andrei Oleyanov is in the room, since he was one of the people intimately involved in this. Uh, but I hope he'll forgive me. Uh, after 1999, Primakov did managed to stabilize the economy, and when Putin came to power for the first three years, uh, Gref Kudrin Olaryanov did carry out a major reform program that ran down around 2003. 2008-2009, uh, virtually nothing, but they were lucky, oil prices came back. Uh, this time, a lot of talk about reform, but Richard Sack was right, it's a great opportunity. It is not happening. What's happening now is as close to a perfect economic storm as one could imagine. Russia's economy was already experiencing really serious structural problems. Uh, oil prices have crashed. Corruption is not being reduced. And the sanctions are having an impact. Uh, people who say it's not true, I think, are incorrect. And one reason I say that is a lot of other people are saying, no, they're doing too much. They're destroying people's living standards. They're turning all the Russians against America. <coughs> that obviously proves they're not working. Um, structural problems have been gathering at least since 2006, if not earlier. Uh, the economic model has been obsolete. Uh, hydrocarbon dependence is not producing growth. There has been virtually no serious diversification of the Russian economy, more dependent on hydrocarbons now than they were in 2000. They reached all the limits of recovery growth from the earlier downturns and crises. Uh, there's no technological progress to be seen. There are no productivity gains. There's massive corruption, and it's corruption of the worst sort. We can talk about that in the Q&A. And the demographic and labor for skill issues are also really limiting factors to future growth. Uh, structural problems, uh, former finance minister Kudrin provided this very nicely. From 2000 to 2008, the revenue from oil and gas to the government was about $900 billion, and growth averaged just under 7%. Uh, the last five years, They've actually reaped more revenue, 1.3 trillion, and growth has averaged 1% a year. That suggests the model has serious problems. Uh, think about Joseph Schumpeter's discussion of capitalism and socialism. You know, uh, capitalism is all about creative destruction. Companies disappear, the assets, the workers, the investment goes to a more beneficial for the economy use. Uh, there are exceptions to that. You know, we all know about too big to fail. The auto industry in this country was a great example. Uh, Russia has a different version of Schumpeter. Uh, they've had a lot of the too well connected to fail problem, uh, cronies, insiders, and they've had what I would call destructive destruction. When Rosneft takes over in order three of the least efficient, three of the most efficient companies in the hydrocarbon industry, and makes them less productive, that's a serious problem for your economy. The oil price collapse, uh, there are a lot of conspiracy theories out there. Uh, Russia says the United States and the Saudis are out to get them. Iran says the Saudis and the OPEC Sunnis are out to get them. Venezuela says the Americans are out to get them. Uh, in North Dakota, this is the Saudis and the rest of OPEC trying to destroy the shale industry. 
Um, it may be that it's just the market. And if it, that's the case, this is probably you know, good news, bad news, <coughs> and really awful news for Russia. The good news is markets tend to correct over time. Uh, the bad news is that generally moves in pretty long cycles. Uh, fairly high oil prices from 73 to 85. Um, poor Mikhail Gorbachev was unlucky. Oil prices were pretty low from 85 to 99. <coughs> After 2000, oil prices came up again. Uh, the problem is that Russian leaders, the awful news, seem to think that this is 2008 all over again, that oil prices are coming back quickly. They might, I doubt it, from all the economic stuff I read, but you never know, they may get lucky. Um, if they don't, the problems are gonna be pretty serious. Sanctions, as we all know, don't work except when they do. Uh, the best studies say it's about 30% success. Uh, people love to make the comparison to Cuba. Uh, Cuba was not particularly vulnerable. You know, sugar and cigars were, are, are just not plugging you into the, the global industrial economy in a major way. Uh, Russia is highly vulnerable. They were increasingly integrated with the world economy. Uh, I call it thin integration. They buy and sell. They don't link into production networks. But they're buying a lot of things they need badly. Uh, the elite does use the public goods in countries that Russia's media revile. Uh, they keep their money safe, they keep their families safe. Uh, Russia increasingly is importing key components, and that's going to be a serious problem. And corporate debt, they're going to have to pay back $100 billion in 2015. Given what happened to the ruble, uh, that costs twice as many rubles as it did a year ago. Uh, data on the components is in the paper. I'm not going to bore you with this. Uh, overall, they're not importing all that much, although it's gone up almost you know, a little less than doubled since 2006. But there are some key places where they're importing a lot. Pesticides and chemicals for agriculture, three quarters. Uh, stuff for the new technology in oil and gas, horizontal dr drilling, fracking. 56% for the horizontal drilling, over 90% for the fracking. 80% uh, of the drilling platforms come from South Korea. Uh, electronics for the missiles and rockets in the defense industry, two thirds to 80%. That's serious. Yes, that can be replaced, but it takes time and it takes money. Uh, they're also responding to the crisis by wasting a lot of money. Uh, the bailouts have already been unplanned and not particularly productive. Rosneft asked for two, almost about two and a half trillion rubles for 28 strategic projects. The entire fund available was three trillion rubles. Uh, they got 300 million for just five projects. Uh, even that really violates the principle of that fund. It's supposed to be infrastructure, they're using it to replace their cash reserves. Uh, banks tend to require more money than companies when you start bailing them out. Uh, by March of 2015, the government already used the 10% allocated from the National Welfare Fund for bank bailouts, and that's just the beginning. They're using up the reserves. Uh, essentially, they've got something like 4.7 trillion and the planned spending, doesn't say anything about what the actual spending will be, is already up to 4.36 trillion. Uh, that means after 2016, uh, there is nothing left in the reserve fund. They've got to start using the National Welfare Fund. Kudrin has been trying to avoid that because that money is allocated for pensions in 15 to 20 years. And with a long payback on these allocations to bail out companies, that money would be there. Pensioners will just be out of luck. And this is one of the reasons why they are now finally seriously discussing raising, raising the pension age. Uh, chart shows you the depletion of the reserves. You know, uh, took a while to build them up. Uh, they're starting to go down pretty quickly, and that's going to get worse in the next year. Uh, skip the request to the welfare fund. Uh, winners and losers in this, uh, which is interesting. Uh, the clean water program has been zeroed. Uh, so don't drink the water. 
Uh, aviation control system down 72%. Uh, you know, they've got one, they haven't unified it. A uh, bunch of others, uh, like Baikal takes big hits, uh, half of the money for one project, a quarter for another. Federal agencies, again, aviation agency, almost a third. Uh, fund for the humanities down 20%. Uh, don't expect internationalization of the social sciences. Small and medium business. Uh, ad advertisements to sell a business in the Russian media press increased 14 times in 2014 over the number in 2013. Uh, in 2010, uh, about 33,500 people left Russia. In 2013, it was 186,000. 2014, the first nine months, it was over 200,000. Uh, one of the favorite destinations is London. Russian businessmen are moving their families and their capital. And England has a really interesting financial structure for people who are willing to invest in smaller medium businesses. Uh, the informal sector of the economy has been growing with disturbing rapidity. Uh, from November 2014 to March 2015, they added three or four million workers to the informal working sector, economic sector. Now, some of those are people who had full-time jobs and were also moonlighting for extra money. But it's 20% of the labor force. Uh, other people say if you count the people who aren't form who are, are still formally employed but don't have enough salary and are working a second job in the informal sector, it's up to 40%. Uh, education has taken a major hit. <coughs> so has science. Uh, seen reports of Russian universities starting to increase their tuition payments and demand that the students pay in, quote, hard currency. Now, if your currency is convertible, there isn't supposed to be hard currency anymore. But instead of paying in rubles, they are illegally demanding dollars or euros because the rubles have been losing their value so rapidly. Uh, Putin's rating continues to be pretty high. Uh, it's an interesting, you know, uh, 1999, uh, the second war in Chechnya, 2003, the arrest of Khodorkovsky, 2008, the war in Georgia, and 2014, the war in Ukraine, invasion of Crimea. Uh, so, you know, hostility seems to be good for the rating. The question is whether the rating is overrated. Uh, Levada Center just put out one interesting little chart. Uh, the number of Russians who would want to wear a button or a t-shirt with Putin's picture is less than one in five. Uh, more important, if you ask them what direction is the country going in, you get a much more negative picture. And he did get a bump from Crimea, but that's trailing off again. And if you talk about consumer confidence, uh, it has been dropping quite rapidly. There's also a lot of cynical behavior. I mentioned corruption. Uh, this is data from a really interesting study by a couple of Cornell business graduate students. Insider trading on the eve of the invasion of Crimea. Uh, Zubkov sold Gazprom stock uh, probably in the second week in February. Uh, it dropped 14% on March 3rd. Uh, this index they've created has shown that a lot of people were buying right before Russian troops were asked to come in, and they made a killing <laughs> as the market dropped. Uh, the blue line is the RTS. The red line is that insider trading. You can see that giant blip right on the eve of the Crimea invasion and the market tanking, coming back some. And you know, people still playing games with the ups and downs. Uh, so prognosis for Russia's economy. Uh, this is a comparison of the Ministry of Economic Development in blue, uh, the Guider Institute in orange. Uh, they're both pretty negative. Uh, GEDAR is more negative. Uh, it suggests a serious decline. And if you project it out to 2016, uh, 
Gaidar is even more negative than Ministry of Economic Development. Uh, but just update from what's happened in the last week. Uh, Putin met with the economists, and I have to say, he sounded a lot like Brezhnev. Yes, yes, we know we have to diversify, we know we have to do this, we know we have to do that, we just don't know when and exactly what we have to do. Uh, he does, I think, sound a lot like some of the Chinese leaders. Uh, if you look at Li's speech to the National People's Congress, it's very similar. You've got an obsolete economic model, you've got to do something about it. Everybody knows that, but actually doing it is not so easy. Uh, so I'm not 100% negative. Uh, Fred Weir just had a piece of the Christian Science Monitor about the Technopolis startup and incubator in Moscow. Almost 30 companies, almost 30 companies, technology ventures that have moved into this new facility. Uh, if you compare it to Tallinn, uh, their Technopol Science Park has 150 technology companies up and running. And even if this works, it's like Skolkova. It's an enclave. It's a separate, isolated area, free of all the problems in the society. It does nothing to address the problems for the rest of the businesses. And that's a serious problem. Uh, I should add a disclaimer, since I'm talking about the negative so much. Uh, Constantine mentioned that I, I ran the International Science Foundation. I worked on a program to create institutes of research education at 20 Russian universities. The ministry now has 400 of them. I'm on the board of trustees of the European University. I have spent a lot of my time in the last 25 years trying to do things to help science, technology, education, and the economy. I take no pleasure having to talk about this, but the problems are serious and they are not being addressed. So the conclusion is that these problems would be serious just from the exhausted economic model along with thin integration and the serious predation in the Russian economy. Uh, the oil price decline and the sanctions have exacerbated it, and the response has been shockingly <coughs> inadequate. Uh, Russia now imports 90% of its tractors. Uh, the food program is going to be a really interesting thing to watch in the next year. Uh, this crisis, unfortunately, is going to be protracted, it's going to be severe, there would have been a crisis, almost certainly, even without the entire Ukraine situation. But this has made it a lot worse than it needed to be. Thanks for staying awake, and I guess we're here for questions. Thank you very much. Um, just going to get the discussion started. I have a few questions uh, for each of you. Um, for Robert, um, how stable is uh, the system, centralized system of government uh, that Putin created, and can it survive the oil low prices? If so, how long can it survive, and what does the survival look like? Uh, Mark, um, can Russia handle two conflicts at once? Let's say Ukraine, and let's say something flares up in Central Asia. Can Russia effectively handle uh, both of them? And is modernization, uh, military modernization program uh, sustainable at low oil prices? And for Arlie, um, given your latest project, uh, can you kind of quickly compare uh, Russian and Chinese approaches to the economy, where they kind of maybe similar and where uh, they're different and where they're heading? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. That's Obviously, the very difficult question to answer. <laughs> uh, usually, the answer would be that the system is very brittle, so that uh, it seems very stable, but it's very uh, unpredictable when it might shatter apart. I don't think, because uh, it's hardly made clear, I don't think the main problem is the low oil prices. I think that the system, and as, as Richard Sacco himself said, that it can survive the low oil prices. But I think what the survival looks like. Is, is more as, as, you know, I think Putin's first choice would be to provide uh, public to everybody to raise salaries, raise pensions, keep paying the pension on time. But when those resources don't exist, then you have to um, tamp down on any social unrest. And that's exactly what we've seen, you know, closing down, or not closing down, but blocking access to various internet sites, uh, going after smaller bits of media, declaring, um, an increasing number of NGOs, foreign agents, and people think 
sort of organizing the courts more effectively, uh, cracking down on elections. It's just a systematic response across the whole political space. So it's, it's just much more oppressive. Okay, um, can Russia handle two conflicts at once? Well, I suppose the question becomes actually how far Russia is currently able to handle one okay. conflict. Um, the latest uh, studies from Rusi suggest that 42,000 Russian troops have cycled through um, southeast Ukraine, which is a pretty big proportion of those kind of more efficient, higher quality troops. And every casualty that they suffer in, in southeast Ukraine is, again, one of their better forces. Um, of course, the ultimate question, though, is it's not a question of whether a system can, can sustain two conflicts. It's how far is it willing to pay the necessary price? Now, okay, I mean, I assume when we talk about two conflicts, we're not talking about sort of a war with China or similar, which would be some kind of apocalyptic sort of scenario. You know, again, assuming that we're talking about relatively controlled military interventions in the neighborhood, such as another Georgia or whatever. Um, yes, of course, but there will be, I mean, putting aside the, the wider prices in terms of what it would mean to relations in the outside world, further sanctions or, or whatever else, it would mean more and more resources being devoted to that. It means obviously more boys coming home in boxes, but it also means more and more money being spent on that, and that's money that you, you do not have available for some notion of structural reform to cover the pensions, to do all the other kinds of things, you know. States are engines to raise and send, raise and spend money. Um, and in a way, this actually links directly into your, your question to Bob, in the sense of, look, the, is the issue is not can it spend the money to sustain two wars, it's what would the implications be if it did that? And again, I mean, I think this is a way in which actually Russia could easily, or the current Russian system could easily spend itself into an earlier grave. Um, and this leads to your, your, your other question, that is modernization sustainable at low world prices? No. I mean, that is the simple and base point. Um, the Russians have a tendency to look at modernization as simply a, a thing of going to your kind of arms sale Walmart and just buying the stuff off the shelf. The point is, it's not just about buying the latest kit. And modern military equipment is ruinously expensive. I mean, you have to look at sort of how much the United States spends, spends more than anyone else. Um, and any, even the United States is finding it difficult to keep up with the, the increasing cost of, of modernizing the military. But the point is, you then have to have troops who are trained for it. Um, most Russian soldiers are still conscripts, doing 12-month terms. Which means that really, really you get three months of usability out of those conscripts, between when they're trained and before they're drunk and demon happy. Um, increasingly, fine, you can buy new and shiny equipment, but are they going to be trained enough to be able to use it? Now, I mean, I think we, we have a model, and in this respect, sort of the military model fits the wider sort of pattern that looks good on paper, but is now increasingly like, unsustainable. <coughs> Uh, thanks for the question about China. Uh, you actually, you know, that was one of the slides I pulled out of the presentation. Uh, you know, uh, Russia and China are a lot alike in that both of them have an economic model that has got to be changed. And Prime Minister Li said this flat out at the National People's Congress last week. Just no ambiguity about it. Uh, Medvedev talked about it for four whole years, nothing happened. Modernization requires more than words. It requires really difficult decisions, and neither country has made them yet. China is now talking about its serious reform of the state-owned enterprises. The reason China can probably get away with this for a lot longer than Russia is that in the 1980s and 1990s, the Chinese bought, developed a massive private sector in the tangible knowledge enterprises and the special economic zones, increasingly in privatizing state-owned enterprises. And that has been the driver of the economy. China's economy is now three quarters private. And they maybe, although you never know because it's always hard, 
are finally now going to take on the state sector, the state of enterprises, which have been, on average, loss making if you count all the subsidies and special privileges they get. Russia's economy has become less private under Putin. Uh, the state sector has grown, the private sector has been clobbered. Uh, read Pomer Peter Pomerantz's book, and especially the section about Yana Nikolaeva, the entrepreneur who got thrown in jail because Russian government oligarchs were fighting over industrial spoils, and she was the collateral damage. She actually was acquitted after seven months in detention. But there are over 100,000 entrepreneurs in jail in Russia. That's not going to develop a healthy private sector. Um, is Russia going to be able to benefit from the relationship with China? Uh, they got clobbered on energy prices. Those deals, if you get into the fine print, a lot of which is secret, uh, do not look particularly good. Uh, China's new investment program looks a lot like the old one, but again, they've got the slack to get away with this. Uh, Russia has really got to change the model of the system, and I don't see signs of that happening. Thank you, and we'll open up a uh, Q&A, and if you could just state your affiliation and keep um, the question to a question, please. Thank you. Uh, right over there. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Alexei Balkanovsky. I'm working for uh, the Russian News Agency, Ria Novosti, here in Washington. Uh, my uh, question is to uh, Mr. Galeot. Uh, just uh, minutes before uh, this panel has begun, the State Department announced uh, 75 million uh, in additional security assistance to Ukraine, uh, including 230 Humvees, uh, drones, and uh, advanced uh, communication surveillance systems. Uh, my question is, uh, um, there's actually several questions that could be asked. Uh, why this timing? Is it this uh, belated reaction to January and February events uh, after Minsk, but still uh, the uh, ceasefire appears to be sitting in right now in Ukraine? And how will it influence um, decision making by the Ukrainians and by Russians? Will the uh, Ukrainians feel tempted to uh, resume um, the offensive, or will Russia be tempted to uh, prop up uh, their own efforts, uh, which they, of course, deny of supporting the separatists? Okay, well, I'm not going to claim to any inside knowledge about how the American government uh, reached its decision. I would suspect that as much as anything else, it's a move to take away the pressure um, on the whole issue of sending lethal um, support for the Ukrainians. It's pretty, I mean, that, if, if anything it would be a game changer, it would be that. Because at the moment, Ukrainians have nothing that can really respond to the T-90 battle tanks that the, the Russians have from time to time deployed. Um, I could not for a minute see this as being likely to encourage um, the Ukrainian government to basically break the Minsk II agreement. Um, having bulletproof land rovers is nice, but again, it's, it's, it's not something that's really going to make, make a difference on, on the battlefield. Um, instead, I mean, I think that what this represents is a kind of a recognition um, of the extent to which this conflict is freezing. Um, and that really is, after all, the, the, the implicit element of the whole Minsk II deal. In theory, if it all works out, then yes, then Ukraine will once again, you know, Kiev will once again patrol all, all of Ukrainian territory, albeit under, under sort of other circumstances. There are so many steps between where we are now. I mean, really, it's, it's the ceasefire. And again, if we look at kind of the, the weaponry, the, the equipment rather that the Americans are providing, it's really, it's, it's support stuff. It's actually to fill clear needs within the Ukrainian military, but without doing it in such a way that it provides Russia with a feeling that it needs to act quickly. Let, let's be honest, I mean, I think if, if, if the decision was made to um, <coughs> provide lethal weaponry, um, given that there will be some time before that, you know, those missiles, which is what we're really <coughs> talking about, um, before those missiles are actually get to Ukraine, before Ukrainian forces are trained to use them and deployed, the temptation would definitely be in Moscow to think, right, well, before our window of opportunity closes, let's do something like take Mariupol. 
So again, I, I mean, I think that sort of in this respect, Washington is, is trading a fine line, wanting to provide political support for Ukraine, wanting to provide practical assistance, and wanting to take away some of the pressure on its right flank here in the States, but at the same time, not doing anything which is going to sort of dramatically change the situation in such a way that might actually encourage the Russians or indeed the Ukrainians to break into it. Um, hi, my name is Jared Toll. I'm a professor at Virginia Tech. Uh, I have a question to you, Mark. I, I found your kind of thesis really intriguing. I wanted to ask about, I guess, the intelligence of intelligence agencies. Uh, we learned recently that Putin did a poll, or at least indicated that one of the motivations for taking Crimea was doing a poll in which 80% of the population apparently indicated that, that they would be fine with uh, being uh, annexed by Russia. And the degree to which there is what to outsiders looks like a conspiracy theory towards, uh, in the reading by Putin of Maidan, the degree to which that is in itself perhaps a product of what intelligence agencies themselves do. In other words, there's sort of mirroring going on. Well, we do this, we kind of engage in all sorts of um, active measures, therefore they must be doing it. To what extent is that also something you could uh, incorporate into your analysis, or is it a case that this is an overreading of Putin as someone who is part of the FSB and therefore has a uh, is has an FSB mentality which he cannot escape? Yeah, I, I'm always excellent question. I, I'm always sort of slightly leery of the school of thought that says you can understand Putin by understanding this one element, you know, his childhood the fact that he was in the KGB or whatever. But that said, I mean, I think it is clear that, that Putin does have a worldview which is much more, firstly, informed by the kind of conspiratorial politics that most intelligence agencies tend towards, because that's, that's what they do. Um, and, and secondly, just trusts these guys more. Than he, I mean, he has more faith in hearing the spooks brief than foreign ministry or whatever. Um, and, and, and here we have this, this malign combination. And again, it's, it's, it's hard to know quite well where a vicious circle starts. It's the whole point of their circles. Um, you have intelligence agencies that anyway tend to a rather more conspiratorial view of the world. A political system in which actually there is strikingly little control over what the intelligence agencies tell the president. I mean, if you think of the American system, you have different intelligence agencies that obviously go brief directly and, and through other agencies. But there are also other institutions. I mean, the, ultimately, the, the role of the National Security Advisor is the person who says, basically, I wouldn't say, oh, we know the CIA is lying to you on that one, but, but certainly says, well, the CIA sounds very bullish on that, but you ought to know there are these alternatives. So there isn't anything like that in, in the Russian system. The Security Council, the Chairman of the Security Council, the Secretary Brother, uh, it, it is not the same role. For a while, ironically, actually, it was the head of the Federal Guard Service, Murov, um, who in some ways informally acted as the sort of the bullshit detector within the, the Putin in the circle. He's retiring, I think he's already free. I don't know if he's actually physically present, but I think he's nothing else, I think he's checked out so emotionally from, from that job. So anyway, then, and, and the intelligence agencies, as I understand it, brief separately. So it's not as if you have four people around the table who might say, well, Okay, that's your view, but what my people are telling me is something else. So they all get their own little sort of child touch to inform the president. So you have competing intelligence agencies that want to please the president. You have a president who is actually inclined, I think, to believe a more conspiratorial view of the world. You have a lack of institutional checks to stop the intelligence agencies basically talking to that mindset. And, and so the circle goes. And I mean, unless and until you have something quite dramatically that goes wrong, which actually will get people thinking, well, hang on a minute, you all told me this was going to happen and it didn't, um, then I think actually this, this, this circle is continuing to replicate itself, which is a, a thoroughly maligned, problematic situation. Again, not to say that others, I mean, you know, 
All spooks have their own perspectives. The point is that an effective political system is one that has checks and balances to draw on what the information that spooks can provide without letting them drive policy. Uh, I'm really glad Mark used the word bullshit uh, because that frees me to apply it to the idea that there was a secret poll saying the Crimeans wanted to be part of Russia. All the polling data in Crimea in the 1990s and the 2000s had numbers wanting autonomy as the majority. Uh, I never saw a poll that said a majority of people in Crimea or Sevastopol wanted to be part of Russia. Putin's own Commission for Human Rights and Civil Society, after the annexation and the referendum, said that 22.5% of the people living in Crimea voted in favor of joining Russia in that referendum. Uh, a lot of people didn't vote. Crimean Tatars couldn't vote. But you know that he's got data that you know, what they did was what the Crimeans wanted is one of the more dubious propositions I've heard today. Right with it. Andrea Larion of Gate Institute. Uh, following uh, Mark's comments, uh, could we talk a little bit more about uh, conspiracy? Uh, uh, the question is to all uh, members of the distinguished panel. Uh, I ask you, from your point of view, who did order assassination of Boris himself? Not who did execute, uh, but who did order. So, what are the reasons? Uh, behind this murder, and what does it say about the current stage of the political regime in Russia, or especially in the middle of this Putin's third term at the topic of this discussion? Thank you, Ashley stole my last question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, obviously that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I think I would answer it by, by looking at uh, the consequences of it. So Nemtsov was never on Russian TV at all. He was sort of a non-person as, as far as the main networks went. But as soon as he was killed, there was wall-to-wall -wall coverage of his murder and, and all the different conceivable theories uh, of who killed him. So I think um, I think Harley asked the question, well, they use this crisis to their benefit. In this case, while the economic crisis hasn't been, in this case, Clearly, the Kremlin is using it because by broadcasting the story of, of the execution and the different theories and who's involved, and, and of course the West is responding as well and, and making a big deal out of it, uh, everything that that does is sends a signal to members of Russian society, Russian to who might want to participate in the political opposition, that you know everybody's vulnerable and we can kill you right in front of the Kremlin. So, so that um, I don't know, you know who gave the order, but. They're not letting this opportunity go to waste. Um, well, the, obviously the, the, the quick and honest answer is obviously I have no idea um, who, who gave the order. But again, um, we're here at sort of what those of us on this side of the table have to sing for our supper or at least our lunch. Um, <coughs> if I was going to speculate, I, I actually, I mean, I, I don't think it came from the Kremlin. I, I can't see the advantage, and I can't see why they do it in this way. Um, but on the other hand, you, you talk about sort of uh, what this says about the regime. Again, I mean, it says it, it says two quite worrying things. One is, I think, it's a product of this phenomenally toxic environment, um, in which everyone who is not 100% um, full-throatedly in support of government policy is clearly a, a foreign-backed traitor um, who deserves every, everything they get which empowers all kinds of unpleasant individuals to feel that they, they, that they become patriots when they take the law into their own hands, or not the law, but actions into their own hands. And the second thing I think it says about Russian politics is we should not regard this as this um, ruthless and efficient centralized authoritarian regime. Um, you know, I, I mean, I suspect Putin spends more time on swimming and, and um, engaging in rhythmic gymnastics with, with rhythmic gymnasts than he does actually on the minutiae of running the country these days. Um, I think that, that we really have to appreciate the extent to which beneath, you know, obviously ultimately Putin is always the final decider when things are brought to him to decide. But actually a lot of things never ever get to him to decide. And I think if we have a whole variety of, again, if I think of my own kind of, um, 
areas of, of, of depraved interest, um, of things like security apparatus. Is, you know, there are clearly people who, who operate on semi-autonomous basis. There's massive levels of corruption um, within the security apparatus. There's massive levels of overlap with organized crime. There's massive levels of overlap, overlap with all kinds of unpleasant ultra-nationalist and other bodies. If I had to guess, I would say that it's, it's you know, it's, whether it's Chechens or whether it's ultra-nationalists, clearly with some degree of purchase within the security apparatus, but not because someone in the Kremlin gave an order, not even because someone in the Lubyanka gave an order, but because just someone in the system thought, actually, we're going to kill this guy. I think it's about time. So it, it's, it's something about actually the fragmentation of the political system in this deeply unpleasant conspiratorial, um, xenophobic almost sort of era. Um, I probably would endorse that. Uh, there are a lot of unsolved murders in Russia. You know, we have Sarovoitova, Stamirova, Polakonskaya. You, know, you might know who pulled the trigger. You never know who ordered it. Uh, and in Karen Dewish's book about Putin, uh, she does unravel one really interesting mystery, which is why so many Western businessmen said they Putin never asked for a bribe. He never asked for money. He didn't have to. Uh, he controlled the mayor's contingency fund. Contracts included 25% that went to the fund. Putin controlled the, pot, the fund. If Putin had any involvement, we'll never know. And I have no idea whether he did or not. But the system is set up to create massive confusion. That's why you have 10 different versions of why he would have been shot. Uh, the more you do that, the more you get people to say, well, you know, we'll never get to the truth of this cycle. Hi, my name is Jan Zeeton, I work in CTR as a visiting fellow. I'm from Finland, and uh, my question is fairly simple. Who is the successor of Putin after 2018? Any guesses? Putin? <laughs> well, probably Putin. A big article in MSD talking about Zimbabwe, comparing Russia to Zimbabwe. Mugabe's been there, he's already 90 years old. Putin's only in his 60s, so I think Putin will be around for a long time. But if you look, uh, obviously, what the president himself, if you look at the opposition, who's left? It's just basically the bombers at, at, at the highest level. There's a lot of other characters involved, but they're pretty poor. So but it's hard to see anybody in the system. I'd say Putin's going to be there for the and the question, um, if it's not Putin, is it more conservative or more liberal? What I'll say is whoever, and I, I don't actually necessarily think it will be Putin, um, but maybe it's because of, of my own sort of history in, in the UK. I mean, I think if it happens, it's going to be a Margaret Thatcher scenario. It's going to be that the elite decide that Putin is no longer the guy they need, um, but they'll want a Putinoid, a Putinish, Putinistic sort of figure, Putin light, maybe. Um, it won't be a Navalny. It won't, less yet will be an Udalsov. It'll be someone from their own ranks who probably they feel will be a chairman of the board. It's, it's, a, it's a Khrushchev to Brezhnev succession, the voyage to someone who's going to be more of a consensual figure. And no, and we, and we will probably won't know about it until it actually happens. Because at the moment, one, one of the most um, dangerous, politically dangerous things to be is to be talked about as a potential successor. That is not a comfortable thing for anyone. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to do this. Um, but they did just announce the year of North Korea in Russia. <laughs> and if it is true that Putin does have a son, oh, that's always a possibility. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for uh, coming. Um, I'd again I'd like to uh, thank um, George Washington for uh, co-hosting the event. I would encourage you also to um, visit our uh, website, the CGI website. Um, and sign up for our digest. We do a daily digest, kind of uh, rounding up the world and Russian and Eurasian news. We're also going to um, start releasing bi weekly economic uh, digest covering uh, Russia and Eurasia. Um, also, look for our uh, upcoming events. So we could have an upcoming event about uh, US Russia relations, the future of US Russia relations. Uh, then we have a Russian world um, event, uh, and the report for that is actually written by uh, Marlene. 
and then we'll have a US, Russia, China report as well. And again, I would like to thank you all for coming, and please uh, join me in thanking the, uh, our authors and uh, presenters. Thank you.